Welcome, Internet, to a psychologist's casual view. And today I wanted to be reviewing a very short and very interesting article called On Countertransference, with a hyphen between counter and transference, which is the old way of spelling it. So, it's an article written by Paula Heinemann. I hope I'm getting her name and the pronunciation of her name right. And it's a very interesting article because it's one of those articles that is not necessarily talked about a lot, but from my understanding, helped uh, develop and popularize the understanding of countertransference. Of course, countertransference is um, a highly um, controversial topic, at least it was back in those days. And I would argue that it kind of still is, at least in France, because of the many schools of thought. And some schools of thought, like the Lacanians, don't believe in countertransference. Or, I should put it in another way, it's not that they don't believe that this countertransference exists, but they feel that it's based on the limitations of the analyst and the fact that the analysis hasn't gone far enough for them to not have it. So I wanted just to make this uh, clear that even though in the Anglo-Saxon countries that might be like a clear and cut answer, it, it, it's not. It's not at least in France and from my understanding, at least in Argentina either. So there you go. That's why there's a bit of controversy. But that's not the reason why I wanted to talk about the article. I wanted to talk the, on, about this article for a number of reasons. Well, the first one is that this article it's very short and it sets the premise, I feel, incredibly well of what is countertransference. So for Paula Heinemann, countertransference is all of the feelings, including the sensations that the analyst might feel towards a patient. And she explains that, at least in back in the in the 50s, there was a lot of, um, how can I say, reticence to touch that concept or to even tackle that idea of countertransference. Because in that in those days in literature, the analyst was presented as a cold and detached individual, one that would not be influenced or swayed by any emotions, be it that of the patient or that of the analyst him, himself or herself. So already we start in on a truism, which is that there, it's a concept that has for a long time been very debated and even Freud himself seemed to have been very ambivalent, let's say, towards this concept because he did acknowledge its existence, but he did seem to think that we had to master it. Something that Paula Einman interprets in her own light, not necessarily as master, as like control it, but master as trying to think about it, trying to be able to use it, because that's what she's all on about. For her, countertransference is a fundamental tool, one of the most important tools one can have as a therapist and especially as a psychoanalyst. And she develops her way of thinking that basically, without it, the interpretations are poor or even blank. And as Thomas Ogden would say, it's not in this article, but can't, meaning that they're the void of life or of real pertinence, clinical pertinence, clinical insight. They're just like there to fit a fairy. And that's what she's trying to say, is that basically without countertransference, you get unuseful interpretations, the void, empty in a way. And the whole process of countertransference is being able to feel those effects and emotions. However, feeling them, they must serve as a guide, meaning that they're not just there and you don't brush them aside, like you think about them, you try and analyze them and what they mean in the relationship with the patient, because that's the important part. It's in the relationship with the patient. And as she would say, there is many levels of it and she distinguishes them basically at the start of therapy maybe the transference of the patient is going to be massive and he's going to project a lot of father figure mother figure images on the analyst but as things go forward he or she might the patient might not might understand a more realistic 
side of the therapist. And that more realistic side comes also through um, an interpretation based on countertransference. So Paula Ainman does not feel that one should share what we feel as therapists at, with the patients. That's very important. She thinks that that would lead to catastrophic results. For example, saying things like, you, I am angry towards your patient because it makes you feel angry, would be a no -go, an absolute no-go for Paul Ainman. What she says is that basically you have to use that tool. He, he is indeed making you angry, but try and understand where it comes from, why it presents that. Why in the relationship does it exist? Because what she says is that we might not be aware of it, but our unconscious is understanding in a deep and profound way the unconscious of the patient. And that's what is resonating. It's beneath any words or any real like verbalization. One might say it's infraclinic, meaning it's like under the radar in a way. She doesn't use that metaphor, but that's what comes to my mind when I read it. That basically it's unconscious to unconscious and that not using it or refusing to even acknowledge it would block the therapy, would prevent the therapy from going forward and the transfer of the patient himself to be able to be analyzed. As it seems that basically transfer and counter-transfer go together. That there's no such thing as just transfer without counter-transference. And that counter-transference needs to be analyzed, honed as a skill for the therapist to be able to not, for example, say, as I said earlier, oh, I'm angry, but that patient makes me feel angry. Be able to, re to restitute something to the patient in a digested way, to use a Bionian, a Bionian way of thinking, even though it's not the same articles, and I don't think basically one had an influence on the other. I might be wrong, but uh, that's how I feel. At least she doesn't mention Bion at all, but that's what I thought of when I read the article. So basically, we have this unconscious and with unconscious, that therapeutic unconscious of the therapist trying to work out what's happening to the patient, and you should use that. However, she and she does insist a lot on this. This technique is important, but that must not at any point become an excuse for the therapist or for acting out of therapists towards the patients. It can't be used as, I did it for my counter-transference. I, I don't know, let's say, I was aggressive with the patient for counter-transference. I was seductive with the patient because of counter-transference. It doesn't work that way. That's just an acting out of the part of the therapist. What she says is that basically you have to keep it within yourself, analyze it, understand it, and then work it out to the patient in a digestible, simple, and clear way. And I am in agreement with her. It's not something that countertransference is incredibly useful. Without it, the relationship, the therapeutic relationship becomes stale, it becomes empty. And by injecting what we have digested into the relationship, it allows for the patient both reassurance and understanding, because that's how they feel that we fundamentally get them through those images and metaphors that we present to the patient. And she does say that that helped her immensely, for example, with a patient that was going to marry a woman in, at a great speed in a way to uh, contradict her and her beliefs. Or well, she said that she felt a lot of anxiety and that through the analysis of that anxiety, she understood how in a way it linked to the anal sadistic uh, part of the patient. And she used it to help that patient realize that he was basically trying to both hurt her and try and fix her through the therapeutic relationship and also in acting out in the outside world. So it is very useful, and she even gives examples of it in her article on conscious transference. And I would invite you to read it, as it's available for free on the internet, and it's quite a short read. And she also goes further by saying that institutionally, meaning the establishment of psychoanalysis, at least in the start, was very reluctant to use it, because A, Ferenczi made it a big point, and also because Ferenczi pushed it too far. He would have acting out with his patients of many orders, but mainly sexual. Not only, I mean, I don't want to reduce Ferenzi to that because his thinking is incredibly diverse and rich and interesting, but 
you can't avoid the bad things. You shouldn't turn a blind eye towards all the negative stuff that's happening. At least that's my point of view. And basically, she says that you sh shouldn't use it like forensic, but you should use it still. And it's still very important. And it's not about absolute transparency. It's about digesting and using it so that the patient can use it. There's no point in just giving your emotions if the patient is not going to be able to use them to the full extent of what you're trying to do. So that's why it has to be worked on by the therapist. And she also says that basically in the whole literature there is that idea of the psychoanalysis as a surgeon, as someone that would cut with a scalpel, uh, um, open the body uh, or, the, or the mind and analyze it and do stuff into it. And she says that that's in a way the wrong approach. It's not about being intellectually sharp. It's about being emotional and human and understanding the core of the relationship through transfer and counter-transference. So that's pretty much it for the article, which is a very good read, and I'll link it in the description if you're interested. And I would also be interested in um, if you want to ask questions or even if you want to add something to the discussion. So I'll see you in the next one. Bye.